I'm good. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the last webinar. Hi, Hannah. I love the people are jumping on right away. It makes me really happy. Um, because I think most people end up watching this afterwards, which is great too, but it's fun to know there's actually someone out there listening to me talk since I'm just in a room by myself. Um, yeah, I'm gonna wait a few minutes just to let people hop on. Hopefully everyone is doing well. I'm here in Idaho, so we're going to be slowly re-releasing ourselves to the public, opening everything up. Okay. Perfect. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm glad it's been helpful. Um, it's been really fun for me to write this all out. Like I think I said in my last webinar, I just, um, I, I do a lot of stuff subconsciously. And so to actually have to consciously sit down and write out my thoughts on writing, <laughs> it's been really good. So yeah, if, um, if anyone wants to ask any questions at the end that are about any part of the process, feel free to, um, since this is the last one, it's kind of, I feel like it's more grab bag um, notes on writing. So, you know, ask away. Um, yeah, so we're doing first chapters today, which is like my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing to write first chapters. The imaginary star student in my mind who's been watching or following along with this webinar from the beginning will have with the first webinar, collected the ideas for her story, You've done some basic plotting uh, and understanding of the worlds that your characters are going to move around in. Uh, you fleshed out your characters and you know what to keep an eye out for uh, when you're writing dialogue. So all of that is kind of in the back of your mind. Um, so now you're ready to start writing chapter one. But where do you start? <laughs> that is uh, that is the age old question. Um, oh, hi. Let's see. Hi. Oh, Elizabeth. Hello. Glad to uh, see you join. It's great. Um, so when it comes to the question of where do you start your your story, the answer is very simple. You start it exactly where your story needs to start. Not a moment sooner, not a moment later, sort of like Gandalf arriving places. Um, but what does that actually look like? Honestly, I don't think that you can really know right off the bat where your story should start, but you just have to kind of take a blind stab at it. You have to take a guess. Um, because, well, just knowing that where you start could be the wrong place. Um, for many, many authors, the first one or two chapters of their story are unnecessary and end up getting cut. Um, as an anecdote here, the beginning of The Winter King actually took place in the High Alderman's kitchens. So it started there with Cora chopping onions and thinking about how much she hated The Winter King. Greta realizes that she's out of time uh, and she sends Cora to go to the village square to get some. Cora goes, she looks through the market, she doesn't find any. She goes to Abalone's, how, uh, the shop that Abalone's family owns, uh, has a really nasty exchange with Abalone, but convinces her to give her some time and, um, and gets it and goes back up the road and meets Peter. So if, if you've read The Winter King, you'll know that none of that is in the story. I had one really helpful editor uh, who, when I was um, working on this story for a contest, who just said, I don't think you need these first couple chapters. I think your story actually starts on chapter three with Cora leaving the market square, holding the time, 
Um, and she was totally right. I was able to just sort of recap that these things had happened. We knew Cora was there looking for time because Greta had run out. So I didn't need to have that scene. Um, I could just say that she had an unpleasant exchange with Avalon. I didn't need that scene necessarily right there. So um, it's, it's something where you really have to be able to just take an honest look at your first couple chapters and think maybe, is this actually what I need? It's sort of like with dialogue. When we were talking about that last week, how some people like me have to write um, the highs and the hellos, how are you, all of that stuff, and then go back and cut it to get to the meat of the interaction. Um, and so it's it's a similar thing with uh, with first chapters. Sometimes you need to sort of like gradually ease into it in order to um, in order to get to the meat of the story. So. Oh, it's Allie. Hi, Allie. I'm glad you liked The Winter King. Um, and honestly, like I said, it might be a little difficult for you to see this for yourself. It's much easier for someone who doesn't feel practically biologically connected to the story to be able to tell you what needs to get cut. So just keep an open mind uh, if someone suggests something like that. But for now, start where you feel the story best needs to start. Hi, Jen. Uh, and. I, I think with this, um, I'd be careful. I'd give a few warnings against starting with something cliche because our brains naturally like things neat and tidy. So we like to start stories in predictable places. Like you've got a main character who wakes up in the morning, gets stressed, looks at herself in the mirror, describes herself. Like all of those things are pretty cliche and we've seen them in movies and we see them in books. Um, so try to avoid doing that. Avoid doing like the first day of school. That's a that's a pretty cliche start to a story, um, unless you have a fresh way to talk about it. So, what should your first chapter do? Well, it needs to introduce us to your main character, preferably doing something dynamic and interesting, not waking up and thinking about their life. Um, I remember I sent a first chapter of a novel to an editor once and part of her feedback was we are getting a lot of what the character doesn't want to be doing. So this was actually on her birthday. Uh, when we, I was telling, I was explaining all the things she would like that she didn't want to be doing on her birthday. And, and the editor said, but what does she actually want to be doing instead? So giving your character positive emotions and wants in chapter one is really good and helpful. It should give us, uh, chapter one should give us a feel for the world your main character lives in. And this is a really important balancing act because if you're dealing uh, in the type of magic that I write, for instance, which is not particularly magical, only slightly, uh, you still need to hint at that magic somehow in your first chapter. It's, you know, if you're writing a fantasy world, your temptation will be to over inundate the reader with uh, names and, and places and magical things in the first chapter. But if you write sort of magical realism or just like one step removed uh, magic, then you may forget to even put it in your first chapter, but it should be in there somehow just with a light touch. If there's no magic in your story until chapter 10, that's gonna throw off your readers. That's that strong right turn that I talked about um, a few weeks ago. And that's the idea of the promise of the premise. You are promising a whole lot with your first chapter or two, and you need to make sure that you're delivering that and not throwing a surprise vampire in on chapter 15. But you also, yes, yeah, so like I said, you also want to make sure you're not weighing down the first chapter with world building on the flip side. Um, so I make a few offhand comments in the first chapter of The Winter King, like uh, I, I think I say The Winter King will return to Frimsby slipping into human form like a banner unfurled. So that that tells us that there is some sort of a non-human entity that takes human form, right? Um, and this leads into another thing that many good chapters, first chapters have, which is an element of surprise or a hint that there's something more beneath the surface. And this can be done in, a, in kind of cheesy ways, uh, like this is, I don't know, like a super cheesy would be like, little did I know that meeting this girl would change my whole life forever or something like that. Real bad, don't do that. Or it can be done in sort of offhand comments from the narrator about something that happened 
uh, in the past maybe that's haunting your character. I did this a bit with the idea of the Draugar. So as Korra is walking the road back to the High Alderman's house in chapter one, I just, I barely mentioned that there's something out there in the woods that she is frightened of that, um, that creeps around out there. I don't pause and explain exactly what they are and how they got there and what their backstory is and what the rules are. I just explain that that is where the Draugar live. And that gives people that hint in their mind, like, oh, there is something else unusual. Hopefully she will come back to this. Your first chapter should also have really lovely prose. Obviously the whole book should be well-written, but it's especially important to weight it into the first chapter. Because again, um, there's something about clear, lovely prose that makes a reader really trust you. Uh, they trust that they're in the hands of a good storyteller. And there have been plenty of times where I have continued on with the story, even though I wasn't necessarily hooked by the first chapter, but because the writing was so good. And I thought, okay, this is clearly someone who knows their craft. I'm gonna learn something from them. It's good to have some tension in the first chapter whether it's the beginning of the big problem that the character will face or some interrelational tension, something that the reader can latch onto and look forward to having resolved. Cora's tension is both internal, right? Her hatred for the Winter King. It's interpersonal in her relationships with Abalone and Peter, and it's external in terms of the feast and her fear of the feast failing. As a quick aside, um, I wanted to talk about point of view here because I actually cannot remember if I touched on this in an earlier webinar, but obviously something that you'll need to decide on now is what point of view to put your uh, story in. So is it going to be in the first person, right? I went to the store, I picked up some eggs. Are you writing from inside the head looking out uh, like you are that person. Are you writing in the third person close? This is what the Winter King is. We're always inside of Chorus head the entire time. So it's similar to first person in terms of how much I'm allowing the reader to experience. It's, it's all inside of Chorus head, but instead of I, it's she. Um, or there's the third person omniscient, which means we can be in many heads. We're kind of head, head hopping. I've noticed that most middle grade tends to be written in the third person. Um, oftentimes the first person, you'll see it a lot more in young adults. This isn't a hard and fast rule and I don't actually know the reason why, but that's just something I've noticed. And a lot of it is going to depend on the story itself and whether it would benefit from a specific point of view. For The Winter King, I started it in third person and it stayed that way the whole time and it worked really well, uh, partially because it's a mystery and so I didn't want to be in third person omniscient. I didn't want to be hopping heads and going, having scenes from other people's point of view because it would give things away. Um, I did try, I think, to write in first person, like one chapter of it, and I actually felt like it was too difficult to be that much inside of Cora's head. Um, she just, she, well, she's a little bit of a caustic personality and it, it needed like a slight bit of a removal there. So uh, the caution with the first person is that if your character has an overwhelmingly strong voice, it will be hard to sustain through the entire novel. The question will come up in your reader's mind, do I want to listen to this person's voice for 300 more pages? Um, because there's no escaping it, right? And also, you're very much limited by what your main character sees and feels and knows. So depending on whether that's something you want, then that, that'll that um, change you know, how you feel about whether you want to be first or third. Another uh, personal anecdote, I spent four months or so preparing to write the story that's set in Venice. I did a ton of research on it. I was researching the 17th century and the characters and costumes and the characters and everything. And I felt like I knew my world and my plot. And yet I was still a little fuzzy on my, my main character, especially. So I sat down and I wrote the first chapter in third person. 
and it felt so flat and it was like pulling teeth. It was just not working at all. It was really disappointed because it wasn't at all what I wanted it to be, right? We have this idea in our mind, this shiny project, and we hope we can pull it out of our mind and onto paper, and it was not happening for me. So I thought about it for a while, and I rewrote it in first person from uh, inside the head of my 16-year-old protagonist, and all of a sudden the story came to life and I understood my main character, and I felt confident to keep moving forward. So I, I do recommend at least trying to write a chapter in a different point of view and just seeing what happens. But for that story, for whatever reason, it, it really needed to be told in the first person. So um, back to first chapters. Really one of the best ways to get a feel for what makes a good first chapter is to read a lot of them. If you have a lot of favorite books in your house, pick them up and just read the first chapter of Charlotte's Web and see how E.B. White sets up tension. Where are you going with that ax, father? Fern asked. Um, read the first chapter of Peace Like a River. That might actually be a prologue, I'm not sure. I didn't look that one up. Uh, but see the way he sets up intrigue. I just recently picked up Ivan Doig's The Whistling Season and the first chapter, uh, I was surprised by both the immediacy of the plot that's introduced, but also the sense of place that is so strong. I'm reading Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes right now, and uh, it's just a great first chapter for setting the tone, for giving us something really ominous, right? Uh, a man limping through town, handing out lightning rods and saying that a storm is coming. It was just fantastic, and the, the writing is really eccentric. And um, so I, I knew the promise of the premise there. I knew what I was getting myself into. The other thing about a first chapter, though, is that you're not going to nail it on your first try. By the time you've written your entire story, even if you decide to start at the same spot, you're going to probably go back and, and fix it majorly, layer in different subplots, that you didn't know you had when you first started out or change motivations or fix the way people talk or any number of things. So all of my comments on first chapters apply more when you're going back and editing. In fact, the very first paragraph of The Winter King is also the very last thing that I ever wrote for that novel. It was like it took me knowing my whole book and exactly what I was trying to accomplish before I could get that first paragraph just how I wanted it. So just remember with the first chapter, you are introducing us to your characters normal, but you're doing it in such a way that it feels like the seconds before a train arrives. I don't know if you've ever been at a train station or a bus station or a subway before, but there's this almost palpable energy as um, a train is pulling up. You can feel the ground rattling a little. Everyone is sort of shifting and picking things up and getting ready. And that's the type of restless energy that I think a first chapter should have, because we should feel like we're starting right on the cusp of something really interesting. So I had a question about prologues, and I wanted to touch on that briefly. Um, they are a hotly disputed topic in the literary world because agents and editors a lot of times just hate them. Uh, and then other agents and editors are fine with them. I was listening to an editor talk recently and she made a point, which I thought was very interesting, which is that one time that a prologue can be really helpful is if you are writing in the genre of magical realism. So it's, it's basically our world, but with a magical twist, uh, I guess you could say. But um, the twist doesn't show up maybe until chapter 10. It might be nice to, set, uh, to sort of seed it in a prologue so that your reader is expecting it. So you don't get that hard right turn that's disorienting to readers. But really, a prologue needs to be absolutely vital to the story. If you can't um, understand the story without it, then, you know, then maybe you need to have that prologue. Um, but there has to be a really good reason why it can't just be chapter one is the other thing. Um, and you will want to avoid the cliches because 
most of us who read science fiction and fantasy almost feel like we have to have a prologue because it was done so much. Uh, but you like you, you'll have this big chunk of backstory and you don't know how to work it naturally into the story. So you put it in the prologue or you're a little concerned that your story starts out too slow. So you just stick a big, exciting action moment in the prologue to like prove to the readers that things will get better later. Don't do that. So just make sure that it's absolutely necessary and then remember that 90% of the time it won't be. So, so that segues nicely into editing your story. Um, you've written your novel, congratulations. Hopefully you've written it, uh, as Stephen King says, with the door closed and the brakes off. So you're just going at it. I think that this is an important thing to do with first drafts, is turning off your inner editor and just going and seeing what happens. So you've done that. Um, the first, and, and, and now you write with the door closed, you edit with the door open is the phrase. So the first thing I do after I finish a novel is I click save, I email it to myself for good measure, and then I walk away for like two to three weeks. Um, I do anything else during that time. I read a whole bunch of books. I watch some movies. I go for walks. Um, when I'm writing a story, I'm making sure that I'm writing 500 words a day at least. And so it, it's really draining. And I think of the creative well as something that you need to fill back up again. So I will just go and, and try to refill it. Um, and then when I've let the book marinate for a while, then I pull it out and I start editing. So everyone's editing process is totally different, but this is what I do. Hopefully this will be helpful. Feel free to take some or all or none of uh, my tips and apply it to your own writing. But I start, and this, this I think is important, I move from big picture edits to line edits. So not the other way around. I would not go into my story and start tinkering with phrases because chances are I will cut those phrases or rearrange them or whatever. So um, the big picture editing is what I do before I send it to beta readers or agents or editors because you should not finish draft one of a novel and fire it off right away, even to your best friend. I think you should wait and let it sit and figure out what you wanna fix too. Um, but especially not to an agent. All books need to be revised. So do this first, this editing, and make sure that you are giving your work the best possible shot in front of an agent. So step one, I print out my manuscript. Because I do all my writing on my computer, I need it in a different, um, in a different form for editing so that I don't just glaze over it. Yeah, Holly says, there comes a point when you've read what you've written so many times that you become slightly sick of it. Yes. In fact, I can't remember which author it is, but when they were asked, how do you know when your story is done, when you send it into your editor? And he said, it's when I can't stand to look at it anymore, which is true. Um, but usually you can, especially after you've just written a first draft, even if you're sick of it, then you can put it away. And um, and then when you return to it, it's you have fresh eyes and you're no longer sick of it and you remember you know, why you why you wrote the story in the first place. So, uh, okay, so I, I print out my manuscript. Um, and the first thing I do is I read through the whole manuscript in as short of a period of time as possible. Um, I can't do it all in a day. I have three kids and a husband, but I try to get it done in at least a week, if not less. Um, and I'm not making little line edits. This is all big picture. and. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to be brutally honest with myself here. I'm trying not to lie to myself at all that things are good or fine when they're not. Anytime I get that little niggling voice in the back of my head uh, that says, this is not very good, then I will write something down, mark it somehow. But I don't write it on the manuscript. I write it in a separate notebook. So I buy myself a new notebook for edits and I will write in that notebook chapter one. And then I will read chapter one and I will note things that are not working. And um, to give you an idea kind of for what I'm looking for, again, this is big picture, but I look for the things that affect plot, character, and setting. So for plot, um, I look at, 
Is it feeling rushed or is it feeling too slow? Did I start a subplot and leave off on it? Uh, or did I start a subplot like halfway through the story when it should have started sooner? Cause I got a great idea, you know, three weeks into writing my story and I just picked up along the way and I need to go back and seed it earlier. Is there anything illogical in the plot? Um, is there no conflict or false conflict? Um, basically anything that relates to the plot like that, I, I will, I'll check for. And then I check for character. Uh, do I appropriately introduce my characters? Does it make sense how I introduce them? Are they consistent? Um, is there anyone who is unnecessary that can be cut or combined into another character? Do I keep their physical characteristics consistent? Do I, um, am I watching out for things like wounds? So people get hurt a lot in my stories. And if I talk about someone getting like stabbed in the arm in chapter two, are they like using that arm without any mention that it hurts them in chapter three, things like that. Uh, do I lose any main characters for several chapters? Are they just out of the picture? Do the character relationships make sense and have a natural progression? So again, this is anything that relates to characters. Uh, and then I check for setting. Are there any characters, um, I'm sorry, are my characters floating in like a white box? Have I failed to describe the world around them? Or alternately, is there too much setting? Am I bogging things down with my descriptions of the plants and animal life? I have been guilty of doing that. Uh, is the setting confusing? Do I, um, and again, this is where you have to be really honest. Do I just have like a vague idea in my mind of what this house looks like? Or do I actually understand what this house looks like? Because if it's just sort of, um, sorry, there's a siren going by and a policeman. I've got a big window right here, so I can just watch this happening. Um, it, it, there, you know, there have been times where I will just sort of hazily describe something because I can't really envision it. And always, always I have readers be like, I, I don't understand what's going on there. I'm like, me either, <laughs> neither of us do. So uh, have I used all five senses to describe the world? That's a big one. Am I just describing things through sight or have I talked about the way the world sounds and smells and feels and tastes? Um, do my characters interact with the world around them? If it's raining at the beginning of one scene, is it still raining at the end or did I forget and talk about the sun? Do I have a clear idea in my head of, um, of what everything looks like? This is where Pinterest comes in super handy. I have many Pinterest boards for my worlds because um, I have a hard time just visualizing things, creating them out of my head. So I, I really like to look at, you know, what does a cast iron fence or whatever look like? And then I get a picture on Pinterest so I can keep referring back to it. Um, and then I guess I have some grab bag questions. Like if you notice that, um, that your something is off with your dialogue or um, well, I can't think of anything else right now, but uh, things that don't fall necessarily into plot character and setting, uh, I would make notes on that too. So it's a lot. I have to read it slowly. I have to, um, to really have my inner editor activated. So for as much as I turn it off when I am writing a first draft, I really have it um, switched on for writing. You have to make sure you don't fall into story grip on your own story and just start reading through being like, this is pretty good. Uh, so I've read through the whole thing. I've made my notes on each chapter. It is lengthy. I often will have like 30 pages of notes or 20. Um, so now I can look at all of my notes and check for consistent themes. So maybe I pointed out that a character dynamic wasn't working in chapter seven and that same character dynamic is not working in chapter 20 and I can brainstorm then. And it's possible that the reason neither of those two was uh, working is because of the way I introduced those characters to each other in chapter two. So what I'll do is I will create a new document called plan of attack. 
and I will write down fix Lizzie and Marcus character dynamic. And I will, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come up with an idea for how I want to do that. Or what I might do is I'll take a highlighter and I like, I'm a big fan of having different colors. Um, so I'll pick pink and I will highlight my little comment about Lizzie and Marcus in pink. And I'll go through the manuscript and I'll highlight on the sides, the parts where they interact. Or I might put pink sticky notes up at the top to show this is where they are. Um, these are the scenes that they are in together where they're interacting. And then I can actually physically see, oh, I haven't mentioned those two characters together in five chapters. I need to figure out a way to work Lizzie and Marcus into chapter six and eight. So in my plan of attack document, I'll make a note under fix Lizzie and Marcus character dynamic. I will write rework the way they meet in chapter two and then add two more scenes where they can interact, something like that. Um, and I will tackle each issue this way. So I'll use the color coded markers or sometimes I've used a whiteboard and had the, and a lot of authors I know do this. They have the chapters written out on the top. <laughs> well, I'm backwards from my Facebook live video. So they'll have the chapters written on the top and then they will have um, down the side things that they're trying to keep an eye on like plot, plots, character dynamics, um, anything that they really wanna chart. And then they'll like put little X's in each chapter where those things happen. So however you do it, the point is that you need to get away from your computer and you need to lay out your story in such a way that you can pull apart each thread individually and look at them and make sure that everything is layered evenly because it can be really overwhelming to look at your entire novel as a whole and be like, how do I fix this? But if you're able to just locate and pinpoint each separate thread, then it's a lot easier to, to fix them kind of one at a time. If you remember in one of the earlier webinars, I talked about um, writing yourself a sticky note or two that describes what your book is about and also what you're really wanting to get across in your uh, book. This is the time to tease out that underlying meaning. Um, so, maybe the more timeless truths you've noticed in your story, uh, or it could be the time to check and make sure that all the threads in your story are still working towards that big picture goal of yours. So this is the big picture edit, and it takes a long time, and it's kind of brain bending work. And that's okay, because again, that's our job, right? It takes a lot of hard work to make something sound simple. You know, pause while the siren goes by. So don't despair if that sounds really overwhelming, um, because it is, <laughs> and you just got to do it. After uh, I've done this big picture edit, then I let it sit for a while. Again, I take another break. Oftentimes, this is when I will give it to my beta readers and get their feedback on big picture things. And I'll talk in a minute about beta readers. but. So once I've returned to it, I print it out again um, with all my lovely new edits and scenes. And this is when I'll do a line edit. This is where I read the whole thing out loud. And for this one, I actually do mark up the manuscripts. So I will cross out words or change paragraphs or uh, whatever. Uh, the reason I don't do this in my Word document on the computer is because it, it gives me one more chance for edits. So I go from making the edits physically to then typing in the edits. And that's that's just like one more step for me to, to make changes. Um, so uh, for this part, I have a checklist of all the things I'm looking for on the line level. And it's things like showing, not telling, getting rid of adverbs or adjectives that weigh things down, removing any unnecessary speaker attributions, it's basically, it is a lot of pruning. I end up cutting a whole lot. For this round of revisions, I read it out loud. And if I change things out loud, then I change it on the page because that will happen. Our, our brains autocorrect when we read out loud if something doesn't work. And so I will then go and change that on the page. If I find myself speeding through something because it's not very interesting, 
then I try to tighten that part up. If I notice myself mentally wincing at a line, then I will highlight it and fix it then or later. So I check for crutch words, uh, just or very. You can Google crutch words and see what they are and then do a search in your manuscript for them and see which ones come up the most. Um, I check if I have my characters nodding their head too much. My characters in my story nod a lot and I remove a lot of them or shrug their shoulders. So I have a line edit checklist that I compiled based off of the book Self-Editing for Fiction Writers by Rennie Brown and Dave King, which um, again, parents, it has some examples in it that I that are pretty mature. So uh, heads up on that. But the, the rules, the checklists are um, really, really helpful. So for the final step, I'm inputting all of my edits and I'm checking things one last time as I go. And once I'm done with that, then I would set it off to my agent or my editor. If you're trying to get an agent, this is when you could write a query letter, which is essentially like a back jacket blurb. It's not a full synopsis of your story. It's a few paragraphs setting up the story and hopefully making the agent interested enough to read your book. Okay, so that is my revision tactic. Um, what's funny about it though is that it's never that cut and dry. Sometimes I've had agents look at things or I've done revisions for them. So that's made everything a little different. Or like right now, the one I'm working on, I am uh, I'm running it past my MFA professor every few chapters. So I'm not doing my usual writing or editing process, but this is like my ideal editing process. Um, it's, and it really does take a village to write a novel. I think that that's an important thing to remember also is that um, we, can, we can get a little prickly when someone suggests that our story isn't good or that parts of it aren't good. Hopefully they don't say your whole story isn't good, but that if they say this is not working or something, um, it takes a certain level of humility to just accept that, um, that all stories need help and they need extra sets of eyes. And uh, you know we don't wanna be a diva about it. So I've talked about first chapters and editing, and now I wanna talk quickly about beta readers because I think that they are extremely valuable. Beta readers or critique groups, um, there are a lot of different ways to find them. As I've mentioned in my Instagram stories, if you're on Instagram, when you pick a beta reader, you're going to want someone who will provide you with very honest feedback. That's the most important thing, right? Not that they're brutal or uncaring, but if your mother is prone to only seeing the good in you and refuses to believe you could do anything wrong and still has your her art, you know, your artwork up on her fridge from kindergarten that she swears is the best any kindergartner has ever done, that might not be a writer or a person who can offer you um, the best feedback. So um, I think it's helpful to have someone who is also a writer be one of your beta readers. And then um, a reader or two who just loves reading, people who you know are voracious readers because people who read a lot have a very natural ear for the proper rhythm of books and they'll be able to pick out what's wrong, what's not working with your story. So they, they might be able to say like, oh, I just, it felt weird that this happened here. A writer might be able to offer you some suggestions as well. Alternately, uh, you can join a critique group the one I'm currently in um, meets once a month on Skype. None of us live in the same town or even I think the same time zone. We have a Dropbox where we upload our passages ahead of time, a few chapters or whatever, and we critique each other's work ahead of time. And then we send it back to each other before the next meeting. So we all have a chance to look over uh, the edits other people have done on our manuscripts. And then we meet once a month for two hours and we talk over each other's work it is, it's just hugely helpful. These, uh, the three people I do it with are all writers as well. Um, and it's, it's just extremely helpful, not only the feedback, but also just being able to, um, being able to sort of, I guess, share with each other the struggles you're going through as a writer. Um, let's see, Allie, where would you send the paragraphs? Oh, well, so with my critique group, we use what's called Dropbox, dropbox.com, which is like an online virtual mailbox, I guess, where we 
we send our work in um, and we can all, we all share it so we can all see each other's work. Um, you can also look up SCBWI, the Society of Children's uh, Book, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Uh, I'm a member of that. They usually have local critique groups you can join, but they also just have a nice support network and nice resources for people. When it comes to giving feedback, I think it's helpful to remember to give compliments as well as criticism. So point out the parts that are really working or that made you laugh or gave you like a premonition, like, oh, I bet this is gonna come up again later. That is hugely helpful um, to a writer to know that, that like, this is the vibe I got. This is the thing I thought, oh, she's gonna mention this later because maybe you didn't mean to do that. Maybe you accidentally uh, left like a red herring for the, the reader and you didn't mean to, so you can fix that. Um, so much of reading a book has to do with emotions. It hits us on the emotional level, right? It's really helpful to an author if you say, this gave me the chills or this part made me feel like this. Then the author can know whether they've achieved the desired effect. I also think it's really helpful to just say this part didn't make sense to me or was unclear or why did this person just do that? I thought that they were more like this. Um, those are all really helpful ways to give feedback uh, when you are part of a critique group, asking questions or giving your uh, response to things. When it comes to receiving feedback, a couple of things. There have been many times where I knew deep down that I was being lazy in my writing. Maybe I'm sort of like flailing around trying to describe a scene or not entirely sure of my character's motivations. So if a beta reader points that out and you have that little voice in you that's like, oh yeah, I, I knew that, you know, then definitely take note of those things. There are going to be times though when someone's criticism uh, or feedback comes absolutely out of nowhere or they'll say, I really think you should cut this. I didn't like it at all and their feedback just will not ring true to you. So remember that not every book is for everyone. If you don't believe me, go find your favorite book and read the one star reviews on Amazon or Goodreads. <laughs> there is something extremely subjective about storytelling. So you don't have to change your story necessarily based off of one person's response. If you get a bunch of responses, then maybe consider changing it. However, um, maybe you get a bunch of responses that say, I don't like the way these two characters interact. You should change it so they're friends instead of enemies. You can agree with the criticism or at least note that criticism, but not necessarily agree with the solution. So sometimes, or a lot of times, people can identify a problem um, and they may not know how to fix it. So they may give you a suggestion and um, and you can say, thank you so much for your feedback and then not take their suggestion, but go and fix it another way. This has happened to me with um, my former agent and with editors. It's totally a normal thing. You know your story best. So you might know how to fix it uh, better than, than anyone else. Um, Another thing to note is that when you get an editorial letter from your agent or editor, or you get an email with feedback uh, from a beta reader, one of the best things to do is to sit down and read it all and maybe take some notes and then step away for a day or two and let it simmer. Clearly I'm a firm believer in letting things simmer because I've talked about it a lot um, and because I have three kids and so I don't have a ton of active time to write but I have a lot of passive time where I just let things sit around in the back of my mind. And I think that allowing yourself time to let it just sit there um, and can be really helpful. And um, it gives you the opportunity to get more objective about it. Initially, you might read people's comments and be like, no, they're all wrong. This is fine the way it is. Or we just can have this weird knee jerk response when people critique our art. Um, so it's really good to to look to like pause and take a step back and um, and let it sit for a while and and then you probably at least I do usually realize that they were right. So let's see, forty five minutes. All right, we're on track. So that's it for 
chapters, first chapters um, for editing and uh, critique groups. Um, I think I'll make a separate post about this later, but if you are interested in having me look over your first chapter, or if you feel good about your first chapter, but you want me to look over your query letter, um, I'm offering to do that right now for $20. Um, just send me a message on either Facebook or Instagram and uh, we can connect. I've had a couple of people take me up on it already, so it won't be like a next day turnaround. Um, you know, I've got some to look through, but I, I really enjoy doing that and offering it as a service. Um, so if you, if you'd like to take me up on that, let me know. Um, and I guess um, I'm all finished with my notes. So if anyone has any questions, I can go ahead and answer them. If not, I will just be done a little bit early today. Should be kind of nice. I'm watching my live feed to see if any questions come in. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe I just explained everything so well. Or maybe I lost lost everybody in the editing revisions part because as I was writing it out, I was like, this sounds really overwhelming. <laughs> Color-coded markers and sticky notes. and But really what it comes down to is just like find your, um, find what works for you. You know, if if that all sounds really overwhelming to you, then don't do it. If you feel like you would work better in a Word document with track changes on and making comments on the side, then then do that. But if you like to write out, I have done this before too. I've written out every single scene on an index card and spread them out on my floor and just looked at them all and tried like rearranging things and highlighted which characters are moving in which parts and um, and that has also been really helpful. So I do different things depending on what I feel like the book needs. Okay, here's some questions. How do editors and agents work? Oh, work. Okay, yeah. So um, for the big publishing companies, for the most part, the editors, um, so an editor is someone who works at a publishing company. They're the ones who buy the books from authors. Um, and they, for the most part, at the big, um, the big publishing companies do not accept submissions from writers unless they have an agent. So when I had was shopping the Winter King around, I signed with um, an agent. She actually lived in New York. That's one of the really great things about the world we live in right now is that even though I'm in Panhandle of Idaho, I and I had never once met my agent, uh, but we connected. I sent her a query letter and um, we ended up signing uh, or I signed with her and she shopped the Winter King around to the publishing companies. So she agents have a great relationship with editors. They usually have a, a specific relationship with specific editors at each house. Um, and they will, uh, they'll put your book in front of the editor. Sometimes they'll take them out for coffee or lunch and say like, Hey, I've got this great book and I think you should read it. Um, at smaller, Publishers, uh, sometimes just depending on the publisher, they will accept what are called unagented submissions. So you can just send your work directly to that publishing company. And all of, all of the publishers will have those guidelines on their website. So you can look them up online and see, um, they'll usually have instructions for how to submit your work. Um, let me know if you have any follow-up questions on that. What if it seems you don't really know your main character? Um, a couple thoughts on that. One is that um, you may need to do a deeper dive into like getting to know them. Um, and the way you the way you do that, I find it's easier to write scenes with that character. Maybe not necessarily even scenes that end up in your story, but just having them move around and interact with their world. And um, I call them vignettes, but they're just like, a, it's like an, an artistic opportunity to to get to know a character that feels less like you're just sitting there and like throwing 20 questions at them. Um, if you've um, if you've already written the whole story and you still are feeling like you don't 
know them, um, then it's possible. Again, I feel like it can be really helpful to try if you wrote in third person to, uh, to try and switch in and write in first person instead and, and see what happens if you like really get inside of um, their brain. Okay. Oh, you love the index card idea. I know. I, I, I've used it in various ways with all my books and found it was really helpful. Okay. When you've rearranged scenes, is it just intuitive or do you have a method for deciding what scene goes where? Um, it is, I think it's kind of both. So sometimes it's been um, because I will realize that I, you know, I needed a character to come into a story sooner um, because it felt like once they came in, then it was really abrupt and 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 uh, went too quickly. So I needed to start them sooner. So sometimes that's that's more intuitive, I guess. Um, a lot of times, though, it is um, because of I'm looking at like I will lay out my story along sort of a plot outline. Um, I think the book, I'm pretty sure it's the book Save the Cat. I hope I'm not wrong on that. It might be that, the other one it might be is called Into the Woods. Um, those are two books on screenwriting specifically, but they work really well for novels too. And they, they have like sort of a plot structure, a skeleton. And so I, um, I will often take my story and lay it out along that and see, um, see if, it's, if it's working. And, and then that might be the point where I realize Oh, this this scene is more an act one scene. Like it needed to happen before um, before the inciting incident, before the character you know took off on their journey, uh, in order for it to make more sense. Um, a lot of times, my big shifting around of scenes has come after I've talked to an editor. So it's not necessarily me doing it on my own. Um, any thoughts on making sure a book that is intended to be a part of a trilogy also stands alone? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, trilogies are tricky, especially when you are um, a new author, because uh, agents can sometimes feel a little like unsure about signing someone on with a trilogy. They really like to start with a standalone. So I, um, I think that the, the, first of all, your book should not end on a cliffhanger. Um, your book should be able to stand alone. Um, and oftentimes when you're writing a query letter, you'll say something like, this is a standalone novel with series potential. So um, I, it, it's one of those things where you want your story to be able to be a neatly packaged thing so that in case um, in case an agent only wants to take a shot with just that first book, um, that, that they can still do it. Um, I think, yeah, I think you really need to have a very clear beginning, middle, end, a very clear um, story arc for just that one story. Uh, do you have to sign a contract when you sign on with an agent? What would be a typical agreement? Okay, yeah, yes, um, you do sign a contract. They're pretty standard, um, at least at the at the bigger agencies. So things to look out for is you you never want to um, you should never be signing a contract with an agent where you are giving them money upfront. Agents do not make money until you make money. So um, so that's that's something to look out for. Um, a contract is usually the contract just says something like. Um, I think for mine, it, it was only for the Winter King. So it was, she was not signing on to represent me for anything and everything that I ever wrote. Um, it just said that she she had the right to, you know, to um, to shop it around. And I can't even really remember what all it said. Um, but it just said that it can be broken by either side with like a 30 day notice or 15 day notice or something like that. Um, if you go online, there's a, a whole lot of really helpful websites for um, querying. Uh, and you can see um, if you just Google Schmagent, which is like S-C-H-M-A-G-E-N-T, 
it's um, it's kind of the industry word for an agent who's being really shady and they can kind of give you tips for what to avoid when you're looking for an agent. Um, agents will also, they take a cut of your uh, sales. So that's, that's normal. That's how they get paid. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I am almost at an hour now, so I'm going to sign off unless there's any other questions. Um, thank you again for everyone who's listened in and given feedback and asked questions. It's been really fun. Uh, hopefully I can do something like this uh, again. And thanks, Michelle. I'm glad you liked it. Thanks, Jen. Uh, I will hopefully hear from some of you with your first chapters and um, or query letters. Good luck to everyone who is going out and starting off on the publishing journey. It's a roller coaster of emotions, but it's super fun and worth it. Thanks, Susan. All right. I'll talk to you guys later.